This is actually adapted from a lecture in a qualitative course that I do. But it struck me as being key because and if my half the time that, that you spend in participatory research, CDPR, is spent in doing workshops. Uh, workshops or meetings seems to be a huge amount of it. And a lot of the tools that we talk about. Ah, you may have a slide, sorry. Okay. A lot of the time it will spend, and a lot of the tools that you use are used as part of workshops. So it's really just trying to look at workshops as spaces for gathering data and spaces for working as well. Now obviously I'm going to focus here more on the data gathering side of it and information gathering. There's a huge part of CVPR that is just basically workshopping, sharing, facilitating. That's not really the space to teach you facilitation skills, I think. And a lot of that depends on personality as well. But just to think about the space and opportunities within the workshop arena for collecting data. So the workshops are a space for community decision making and a potential source of information. And you know, right from the beginning, from your first meeting, you're going to be working in this kind of structure. These are really facilitated, directed forums for discussion. And so they differ from a focus group kind of structure or other structures because you're going with an agenda, you're going with fixed aims and objectives to, of what you want to get out. And you're going with, a, with an operation. And the, these workshops can extend from an hour or two to several days. Um, so there's enough space to move to explore the issues. People might move in and out of the discussions. There might be specific spaces where you need to use to participate or specific spaces where you need um, older respondents or specific spaces for women or men. Normally you'll try and keep a core there the whole time. And that would, you know, if we go back to the earlier lecture, we spoke about having a core team of people that you will work with. And that's kind of your reference group and your process. And they even people, even if the reference group is from the community, they won't know all the community positions and understand all the discussions that have been going on. So the system is really you have a structured discussion process, including an agenda and a chairperson. Um, and, you know, the size of the game is also fairly flexible. You know, a workshop normally talks about it at least about five or six people, but you can get up to 50 or 60 people and keep it manageable. Um, it obviously requires much stronger sharing skills and much stronger control skills and best to hold the discussion. Some are audio recording, they're very difficult to audio record, particularly once you get to that size. Because uh, just being able to find a place to put mics and the levels of interference, interference noise, etc., often makes the kind of audio recordings impossible to use. So often you're, you rely far more on notes or even documents developed in the process. And you can with very tight sharing skills and directed mics make maintain an audio recording, but it's also the structure of workshops when you're breaking down to groups etc means that it's, it's more difficult to, ch uh, to establish a single recording now your workshop will normally have a priority of an action research action approach so you will get together to maybe set the objectives for the research or to set up a discussion, or to start to plan a campaign, to or to if a problem has arisen in the organisation, 
uh, around, say, difference of opinion around the strategy to go forward in terms of how to apply pressure on the, set, on the city council to develop toilets, to continue on that uh, example. Then there might be difference in opinion might have arisen, or difference in strategy might have arisen. This workshop become a place to address those. So generally you'll come in, you'll call it for a specific purpose and to interest me a specific need. And, yeah, so it's planning, forums of discussion from principles, meeting for larger groups of people, spaces for negotiation. It can also be used for education and training. So you might set up a discuss, you might set up a workshop to train the community members in survey research, how survey field work or how to do interviews. All of these are particular approaches, but I think what's important just as CBPR researchers is it's still also a place for you to gather information, because people will inevitably be talking about their own context. So you use that space. So it is, you need to remember always a dual purpose. So in CBPR it is essential <coughs> to be doing this planning to be doing the negotiation of accessing different groups and to be working with the different groups. <coughs> um, for doing, uh, for doing a, a training and education. But at the same time, you're wanting to keep gathering information for yourself and for your own knowledge of the community. And even for the community members, this kind of gathering of knowledge is important because it's a way of organizing. That's the one thing that research is a good at or one of them anyway, is that we organize information. And in, in that organization that we approach a systematization that makes it research rather than uh, any other kind of data gathering. So, yeah, and if the subject of interest is participants' workshop tends to produce enormous amounts of information. And generally within CBPR, if you're following the CBPR principles, you will assume that this is something that is of genuine interest to the community because they are, you know, it's, it's been their aim and objective, it's their community. So the, te the tendency would believe that it would be something that would be of importance and so there would be a commitment to it. And people would become in prepared to talk and to share information about what, the, what they know about their event. These workshops often form part of a broader research process and we've spoken about roughly the CBPR process. Um, and I'll talk about that in more depth in the next lecture when we start talking about how one structures a protocol and an approach to a role to CBPR. Um, they use the, so they form part of a broader process. So in the early phases they might be literally sharing information, getting to know one another, setting aims and objectives. Later on you might move into design issues and talking about how to respond. Then you might move into training around the research. And then you might move into analysis of the data. So, you know, there tends to be a process. And over time relationships are also developing. And there's more and more, and more trust is starting to develop. But say, so, yeah, so they're useful for, you can, yeah, you can also be used for policy critique for approaches, if there's a particular policy within the government, with from the state around, say, the diarrhea, so diarrhea and toilet, the committee can come together and discuss and develop critiques. And it's a way of also developing process going forward. So the output might have multiple forms, you know, the output document, there's, and there's the odd range of outputs that you need to look, be looking at as a researcher. There's a formal documentation. So at the end of a workshop to look at aims and objectives, you'll have those aims and objectives, which you tend to, the workshop is done well, we tend to probably be not much more than one or two pages. You know, be half a page of the core aims and objectives and about another page and a half of some of the background information in addition. But you will have in addition to that, you will have a mass of information on the context. And this will be stored in your own notes, in notes and small group discussions. You know, a standard workshop goes through a tree of paper in terms of whiteboard, those large sheets of whiteboard paper of um, 
what's it called? Um, it's often, it's really important to be meticulous in your organization and collection of this. And it is something that CBPR researchers are probably famous for doing badly, is taking that information down. A lot of it just, at the end of the project, you'll see this pile of paper in the corner of information which still has to be garnered. So if, if you're going to do it, you need to try and do it as rapidly as possible and if possible assign somebody within your research team a responsibility for capturing that and turning on to an electronic basis. There will also be behavioral observations that you'll have made during the workshop. So, aim for uh, one workshop we ran on to develop a parenting tool, parenting training education program on the work site. You know, we had people from a range of work sites, we had worker organisations, and we were primarily working with city councils, we had members of their wellness committee and the workers' representatives on that. But what was very interesting was just the different levels of participation. There was quite intense participation from the city council people that had already participated in an earlier phase. And the workers, but it was interesting, the workers stayed a little bit further back from it and they participated really around the implementation side of it. We had people from the um, um, Peter's FET committees, further education training committees, you know what they are? Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody knows what FETs yeah. are. Okay, okay um, a representation from them in terms of taking this training out to different sectors and they participated at particular points and you can just watch that you know, when there's actual discussion of the protocol they were staying quiet and then they came in on the further expansion and saw a role for themselves a representation from other work sites uh, in terms of some major some type of uh, shopping centre major shopping major uh, shopping centre so you had just one discussion you weren't yeah. just smaller groups no it was one discussion mm -hmm. and so and they, when we spoke about implementation, that's when they came in. And they made it clear that they were there, they were contributing, but we are going to have to reduce their load massively if they were ever going to participate. They work at don't get lunch hour, they get half an hour to the manager's discretion. They'll get half an hour, but when it happens is at the manager's discretion. And so, yeah, you know, so it became, and they became animated at that point, but the rest of the time you could see they were looking very resistant. So you've got to observe those kinds of processes as well. It's exactly what is going on, background information. So if you see in a grouping that there's one group that's becoming very irritated and you can see that with, you know, like arms crossed, hearted expressions, etc. That often goes to the youth when they're talking about and the, and, um, and the older people are talking you often get those strongly resistant expressions or if the women start taking out their netting and girls to look after Kate and you know they are irritated <laughs> so yeah you've got to keep monitoring that and if you see those processes happening start moving people in I remember I facilitated a large discussion amongst a whole lot of left groupings within the house part within the health organizations and trying to pull them all in and you have to very carefully monitor when particularly the less professional groupings uh, less groupings that occupy the people of lower level profession when they were starting you had to put particular effort into drawing them into the discussions and so uh, you were, it's, it's something that's it's part of sharing skills but it's also information so when you leave that workshop, you need to know that, okay, we've agreed these aims and objectives, but there was a very low level of commitment from the youth. So you need, if you're going to keep the program going, you need to find something else that the youth can do. It's a hard work being a facilitator. And often you need to have a team of two or three of you there. So that one person, one or two people do the chairing and one or two people doing the observing, keeping notes, doing background checking work, if somebody's feeling irritated, you go out back and talk to them. 
and work with them to draw them in. Bring, they can bring the complaints to the chair quietly, and you can you can find a way during the tea break to start incorporating them more. What if, so we had a workshop about a year and a half ago in Spear, and it was all OEC, a lot of OEC members from across Southern Africa. ROC. Um, we should have the committee. Yeah, ROC, I think. From across Southern, no, all of Africa, and we were discussing consenting issues for biobanking research. And we could be such a large number, what we did was split them up into eight groups. Mm. And we had then two people to sit. So I facilitated and someone else was taking notes. And then we tried to bring those all together. But that was the purpose of that was more to find out what were the issues in each country mm. and to gather that up. But next year, we need to, and we had another meeting this year, something similar. Uh, but next year, we need to actually start doing action points and creating this framework. But we're wondering what is the best way in which to go about this. Um, because we have a certain key points. And what I suggested is that we actually draft something that they discuss. We're wondering is it better that they discuss en masse or should we break them up into groups? I find that it's, you know, okay, and I think that it's a good point. It's about um, each people as well. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about this because I think this is a nice example anyway for, the, for, the, for, the, for this lecture. And I think you've got to vary, you've always got to assess your audience and assess the process. Decisions get made in the plenary. And that, so that is something that you always need to bear in mind. So that discussions might happen in the small groups, but they always have to be brought back you know, for formal yeah. decision making. And if a process has gone through in a small group, there might be a decision made, but those motivations will have, also have to be brought back. So yeah, it depends on the level of contentiousness of some of decisions and discussions. One or two of them will be contentious. So you need to, while there might be small group discussion, they might also have to come back. Now one of the things, I often, and I'm, I know there are different opinions on this, my own sense is often a good idea to present some kind of initial draft. Yeah, that's right. It is more efficient. Yeah. But just <coughs> state up front, you're very happy for this to be torn apart and act that. So the first time somebody tries to challenge it, don't yeah. start defending it. Well, Just have, change it. We have, small, <laughs> we have a small group in ourselves and we have a monthly call and what I propose is that if we can't get agreement on some issues, we should present those areas of disagreement that this is what some of the group is thinking, this is what other the group is thinking, rather than having a, a draft which we all agree. Oh yeah, no, no, that's the kind of thing that you would present. You present a work in progress. Yeah. And that I mean, just bear in mind that even the things that all of you agree on some people might disagree yeah. with. Now there might be a sense of, you know, you might all agree that a single consenting process is adequate, where somebody might argue there that you need a multiple consenting. Yeah. You know, that they consent at the point in which the body part is donated, but you know, they might then want to specify certain constraints and how it can be used. If it's used outside of that, then there has to be a reconsenting process. So, you know, that you might be easy, you know, that it yeah. makes sense to have a single consent. Yeah. But you need yeah. to keep those processes open. And what do you do if they keep t t focusing on one topic and you need to move on? Okay. There are issues around parking uh, that one can use where you have a, a, a section of, of a board or a white or flip chart page where you park issues. But you do need to make sure, uh, what I've seen is really bad that happens in many meetings, is that you get to the end of the meeting and say, oh, we, all these issues we parked, we'll get to them at the next one, or we'll send out something. You need to actually make sure that they are discussed. Okay. So what you can do, what I, you know, a strategy that, I think is if you've got a lot of contentious issues and there's a lot of need for discussion, and if there's some groupings that are less vocal, you need to break up into small groups. The issue of small groups is that it can speed up and can slow down because in, in the area of a small group you've all got to have always got to have report back and you've always got to have space for discussion of what is presented. So, so it's just eight is quite Yeah, eight is huge. It is a big group yeah. and it's and it's hard then for some people will feel intimidated yeah. to so people Two people will be new because we want to bring in some policy makers. Yeah, um, and I think, and it de it depends how long you've got. 
Yeah. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got a presentation probably, and what I would suggest, and you can work freely from this, and this is just an open, you know, is to present something initially for an hour, with all the open spaces for discussion, etc., then have uh, an open discussion around that, and then have a series of <coughs> small groups that report back around the contentious issues, or maybe one around all the, the core agreements that you've already established, and, so, and, and maybe split the contentious issues up. You know, two small groups go and discuss that, two go and discuss that, two go and discuss that, to discuss the fourth one. And my fun question is, sorry for... No, 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 <laughs> just the one thing is that, is to then bring those back okay. for discussion with motivations and give an adequate time for feedback. Yeah. And, one of the, and, and then schedule a time for issues that are popped. Mm. So schedule a time saying, the last two, the first two hours <coughs> on the st second half day, I don't know if you worked out, the last half day, will be for issues that we park. And then the last half day is for pulling the stuff together. So try and achieve everything you need to in the first day. And then have the second next half day for outstanding issues. And they will almost certainly be outstanding issues. Yeah, cool. And my last question is, um, so we were trying to, when we were talking about splitting them up, how would we go about splitting them up? So for the first meeting what we did is, because we just wanted feedback on a certain amount of issues, and we wanted a good mix, we didn't want all the kids, uh, South Africans to club together, so we actually broke people up according to the country in which they're in, so there'd be a good mix of each group. For this meeting, what they're thinking of doing is that they just say, oh, whoever wants to talk about commercialization, go here, whoever wants to talk about like uh, confidentiality, go here. Is that a good idea? Like, I'm not too fond of it, just simply because I'd be so worried that for the controversial issues, people would flock to that, and then there's nobody talking about this. Well, you get people just to... Um, <coughs> maybe the one option is just to... You, know, you put up a list, and there are spaces on the list. Or an expression of interest in advance of the meeting. Yeah. So people, when they're coming in, you know, during the key boat, you can sign up for one of the groups, and there are spaces on each small group. And it does mean that you might get people hurdling and beating each other up to sign up on the front of the two of the groups. But you know, once the spaces are filled, the spaces are filled. But if we email them in advance, because they have to read some materials in advance, we can ask which group would they be interested in. So at least then we have an idea. Yeah. And, and you then just say, you know, if there are too many people in one group, you will be arbitrarily assigned. Yeah. Or give a first or a second, second group. Preference, yeah. yeah. And if nobody assigns, nobody's interested in, say, commercialization, then you say, we you will assign people who you think are most appropriate. Okay. And you might have make some bad friends and we're ready. <laughs> the one thing that is very difficult on contentious issues, and I would imagine is going to be that, is that there's a, lot, there's a lot of repetition. And it seems to be, it's a very particular African tradition is to repeat constantly. Um, something that's frustrated the industry in the meetings. But I think it is in pretty much wherever people, yeah. But it is, and if you try and control the repetition, it's always a difficult issue, but you know, that's a side issue. Um, outputs can not, um, yeah, I think that is useful when you start putting those notes together from all the different sources, triangulate them against one another and just make sure. So you need to make sure when you get to the end that if you're set, your aims and objectives are being set, that, um, that these align with what was said in the discussion. And when you go to writing up a formal proposal, you will start to put, to put together all of these context issues. And I think that might be useful for yours as well, is that you pull all of the, when I presume somebody from this office, your office is going to be pulling all of the discussions together. So when you pull those together and then that consolidated document, so you'll have the document that was produced by the plenary, and then you'll have a document with all the background information. <coughs> and that can also be sent out for discussion, virtual discussion. And it's, a, and it's something that people in South Africa are normally good at our workshops. Um, it, we, I, and I've met, uh, NGOs and CBOs are so much part of, uh, in particularly South Africa, you know, by my sense, I mean, when I, during the 80s and even later, whenever 
you know, you went to a community or st- went to one community that at an obvious level was a single organization of community. We hired a hall to meet with all the NGOs and CBOs. There wasn't space in the hall for all of them. <laughs> and it's basically, it's, a, it's a African tradition. If you see somebody in need, you do something to organize it. It generally means that some general group of women will get together and organize. So, it is a, a system that's very familiar to people, and particularly in the African context. Practical arrangements, and I think we have discussed a fair amount of this, but yeah. People need to res- usually come prepared to discuss material towards a specific goal. So, you know, if you're dealing with a very literate audience, it's like an academic audience, you can send them readings in advance. Otherwise, you can send them a set of aims and ob- at least people need to be aware of the aims and objectives of the meeting. And to have had some dis- space for awareness or discussion of it before. So if you wanting to pull together around the ethics committee, yes, there would be some previous exposure, but if you wanting to pull together around Darrell, uh, issue of Darrell in a community and the five population, you might send out a brief communique, you now these are the number of cases that occurred last year, this is some of our concerns, please think about it in advance of coming to the meeting. You need to be careful to some degree, particularly if it's a, a new audience that you don't tend to construct discussion in advance. Because it's one thing I became aware of when I did some, did a CBPR technique as teachers. And I was looking, I asked them about the mental health issues and of the pupils that they faced and said, you know, you should be interested in other things like depression, anxiety and um, trauma responses. And the only mental health problems I've represented back to me were depression, anxiety and trauma traumatic responses. Okay, it does have a lot of the gamut, but I mean, it was, it was just very, it was just, you know, you've got to be careful that you don't prescribe the discussion too much. Then you need to be large or conducive for large group discussions, preferably with breakaway rooms or sufficient size that you can split up into within the large room without interfering with one another. Strong chair and chairs and scribes need to be included to facilitate and record the discussion. And I think just to talk, the chair needs to be somebody who can control a discussion and does, um, doesn't have too strong a vested interest, or if they do have a vested interest, it must be sublimated to the needs of the project. and must be open, must be sensitive to picking up on everything. Again, the scribes need to note as much as possible, not just also much as what suits them. You'll need to split this role between the researchers and the community leadership. So, you know, there'll be spaces where, and that, you know, if you're running genuine CPPR approach, you need to put community members in the chair at various points in time to, control, to facilitate the discussions as good as you've been in the chair, and they might chair the discussion completely, and you just sit in the background. These are decisions you need to make as you're going along. And the same with the scribes. Again, pick people that have got these skills. So if you're going to pick a chair, pick somebody who's used to exercising control, a teacher. Generally, ministers are not good, because ministers are too used to talking themselves. And so they will tend to want to talk a lot. Yes, this touches me and that reminds me of a story. <laughs> or imposing moral leadership. While moral leadership is good, it's, it can be, can direct. Uh, the clear agenda is needed to be set out in advance. And if you want people to put in specific inputs to prepare that, to get people to prepare in advance, so in your case, it might be useful to get somebody from Tanzania, to say, so somebody from Tanzania is on a particular committee, say, please prepare something, a five-minute discussion for the small group, if they're going to be part of it. So it might be useful to do something like that in advance as well. So people come very specifically prepared. And you do also get the, the issue, and particularly people traveling through internationally, of 
I can become there, but okay, if I'm going to try and skip this morning session to go up Table Mountain or this afternoon session to do the wine routes. Yeah, no, and they're always in lovely venues. The last meetings have been closed. Yes, no, that's... Um, <laughs> it's calm we have our meetings. <laughs> yes, I know. No, I always want to be in lovely... And the other side is we used to go to HSLC meetings that used to be held in the most horrendous places in the universe. <laughs> and it's just so depressing that, you know, you want to kill yourself by the end of the meeting. <laughs> There's these huge centres near the airport. And a friend came out to see me and it took an hour and a half to get there from Joburg. They're completely solar. So, you know, you need to balance that. And if you do have it in a lovely place like Rick Falls or Cape Town, you need to make sure there's structured time to do the things that you bought them there for. If you bring people in and you say, okay, you'll arrive on an 8 o'clock flight and leave at lunchtime the following day, and you'll be in discussions the entire time with the exception of an organized formal dinner that will take place in the hotel that yeah, you're going to have some irritate or people that are going to skip off. Destruction is skipping off in advance. Uh, catering is required, particularly if you work, mind you, if you work in professional arena as well. Um, but particularly in community, you need to provide catering. People expect food. And this is universal. Now, if you want to get people the magic words, refreshments or lunch will be provided. <laughs> if you don't say that, your chance of getting people there are minimal. <laughs> if you do need a community setting, use community caterers, use people from the community. Uh, it builds a commitment to the process. Um, the one thing that I would say this even though might uh, conflict with some and big academic and big industrial things tend to overspend sometimes and I know there was the one structure I was just talking to a colleague who works in the alcohol, alcohol industry the social relevance section you told these workshops for about with about 200 people it cost about half a million per event yes. they hold it in the fanciest possible hotel but only parts of hotels only with very elaborate formal meals, um, shows, the whole thing. So you need to make sure that it's balanced. This is about community and about events. And it is more difficult when you find people from around the world. So you do need to balance the, uh, having a really nice space with keeping costs reasonable. And it, it applies more in community settings because they'll be very aware of uh, if money is being wasted. And I found that very often have using the community catering, you get a much nicer food. Maybe not always as healthy, but a much nicer food and a lot, lot cheaper. And you just build your community connection. And we ran the one series of workshops on parenting training. We had an incredibly tight budget. And I think we fed, I think it was about 500 rand per session to feed 15 people. <laughs> and the mothers who came to the session would, uh, would end up taking food away. With them. And that was just using local cases. Not a lot of food, you know, they take a small quantity. And there's generally pup and borrowers with tomato sauce and some vegetables. It would be very basic, but I, mean, I ate the food very happily, so it was... <laughs> <laughs> but then I tend to like to food in community food. Okay. Um, selection of participants. The nature of the workshop will often define the participants. But you still need to make sure that you get as broad a representation as possible. Usually the people or organization representatives are involved that have knowledge about the issue or place under, under discussion. But there is a tendency sometimes to look only for leadership. And there's a need, need often a need to go broader and to look in more in depth. Um, Selection is deliberately purposeful to find the best possible people to participate. And this really you've got to try and look at, you know, the work that I did with Sabi that I spoke about in an earlier lecture. They 
you know, they went and they got formal elected representatives, they got tribal representation, they got health, rep- health service representation, they got NGO representation, including women, commercial organizations, youth organizations, health NGOs. So, and they just went as broadly as possible. And that's the kind of strategy you're looking at. The try and get as broad a representation of all as possible. But, um, yeah, if you're working in burial groupings, you need to get mothers, you need to get community leadership, you need to get preschools, anybody who's involved with young children. But you also need to you know, often the groups that are missing from that are young mothers. They're often amongst the most powerless in the community. So you need to find a way of pulling in some representation from them. Um, you may need to do more than one workshop to connect with different sections of the population. So your initial workshop might have the people you initially have access to. And part of the purpose of that workshop is to find additional people to draw in. Care must be taken about the mix of this conflict does not occur in one group. Conflict does not occur or one group inhibits another. And it is a difficult one because very often, you know, women will be intimidated, will be dominated by men in many discussions. Uh, youth might find it difficult to talk in front of uh, elders. And you need to make sure, and that is part of community's process. So you need to find ways of getting around that. And one way is a small group. And yes, another way of splitting your discussion is researchers versus into small groups of staff. One has some groups of research, of established researchers and groups of new researchers. Just to have another and uh, another way of looking at it, so that the old, the new researchers aren't being dominated in the discussion. Recording of data, general length of time makes length of time and the size of the group makes it prohibitive to try and audio tape and transcribe a full workshop. But this may depend on the relative importance of the session and if you can set up, and I've been in workshops where discussions are set up in a particular way that everybody has a mic in front of them and the chair has a mic and you request your turn to speak and when you're speaking you press a button on your mic so only your voice is recorded. But that's very unusual in the community setting. But generally the most common are the workshop minutes, sheets of newsprint, jointly created documents, copies of directed, prepared inputs from speakers, and then notes from the small groups. The scribe should also take more detailed notes of the discussions and keep records around. As I said, a separate scribe must be introduced to you know, group dynamics and group process, separate from the content. Discussions of participants during breaks must also raise and give information on the process and content that may not be raised publicly. And you need to be very aware of this, because if they often, I found it often in workshops, that while I'm having a private discussion, while I'm doing the tea break, somebody will approach me to say, you know, I couldn't say this during the event and I know it will cause problems but this is what I feel. And then you need to find a way of incorporating that back into the discussion. Also without asking that person. Or you need to at minimum put that, store that in your mind as a potential concern for the future. The letting here the outcome can be confirmed by constantly checking back with members about resolution statements. And you need to be aware, particular community systems, while trust is developing, there might be a tendency because of historical systems for them to agree with the researcher on whatever the researcher says. And to try and be adjusting their perspective to what they perceive the research team is wanting. And they so get more emboldened and contact is developed. So they may want to start asserting themselves more and so decision resolutions might change. And this will often be accompanied by a fair amount of lust of it guys. Just accept that and accept that decisions do develop and some will sometimes change over time. 
as the relationship develops, so this is likely to become less and less of an issue. Also be aware that there might be attempts to, del- to deliberately exclude some groupings, and once they get included, processes might change. The validity of outcomes is confirmed by constant checking the outcome in the minutes. The minutes can also be distributed, so the discussions plus some of the background should be distributed. Um, I have discovered a lot of this already, but I specific consideration to find clear aims and objectives should be agreed by all, and a more power-balanced approach is required. So to try and balance power in advance, both between whoever's chairing, if that's you, or whoever's chairing and the rest of the grouping, and across the grouping. Selection of who should participate, the purpose of selection, setting the agenda and process, Facilitation requires strong skills and benefits from experience. And, you know, part of this, again, with CBPR is developing these skills. So it might be a case that one, if the researcher and one or two communities starts presenting the discussion, is that over time this becomes more shared and that the person mentors someone, some of the youth or some of the other members of the community to develop and uh, to, um, to develop sharing skills. and be very clear on the potential need for confidentiality in the use of final documents. Now, very seldom in a workshop is confidentiality a crucial issue because almost by definition it's a public event and access to it is often public. But you do need to be aware that there will be cases when confidentiality is an issue. And particularly, you know, if you're dealing with a sensitive issue, so if we start dealing with gender violence or something that's a crucial issue, Incidents of people might present issues, and then you've got to be careful how you deal with it. Okay. And this feeds into also into your stuff, Terry. I mean, very often uh, a workshop is, the cases where workshops are individual events. And you might have multiple workshops in a community, and now all individual events. But very often workshops will form part of a series and there's a developmental approach. So the first workshop takes discussions to a point and then and where some level of clarity is emerged and that you set that in advance so you don't try and set in the beginning to sort of resolve all the issues but you're trying to achieve a certain point. Then the next workshop will take it to the next point. And this discussion is summarized by the facilitators and distributed prior to the next workshop and used as a basis for the discussion there. Additional investigations may be undertaken in the interim, so you might get your discussion at a certain point. And for example, the work we did around the developing of the parenting skills um, um, manual, or the training program. In one workshop, in one project, ended up having three workshops. In the first one, we presented an original model and called for input from community members. Then we ran a pilot of the program, and from that pilot, we redeveloped and, re- and did quite a considerable amount of work in redeveloping it. Then we took it to a second workshop, and there again we so we had both the discussions of that first workshop, plus we had a lot of interim work had been done. And then that, that follow-up workshop, there was a different set of aims and objectives. And the people, it was a thread to the first one, and there were a lot of common uh, attendees. And then we ran a fuller trial, and then we did a third workshop to discuss some part of the final details. So, alternatively, it might just be that you do, and that's something I do with the uh, education department. We looked at implementation of policy, pulled out a documentation, and then went back and did a follow-up workshop with them to look at a more, uh, to take the implementation issues further. And the process, sometimes, you know, sometimes there will be a free range of one, two, or th- two, three, or four workshops. Sometimes it can be an unending, or sort of no, no prescriptive, pre-ending and continue until a formal resolution is achieved or until you be bought and um, wear people down. 
a global situation analysis of review of how patient dissatisfaction might go through several cycles to identify all the problems. So in your first workshop you might have, um, there might be an identification around problems with cues and you start looking at solutions for that. You come back and the next workshop will identify maybe the problem is um, opening times. So you start to find solutions to address that. The third workshop might be the attitude of some of the staff and you find, start finding solutions for that. And this is kind of an active process of work of, of, of the time. Policy review might focus on different issues, content implementation. So in your case, you, know, you did in the first workshop, this workshop picks up on a lot of issues. There might be some issues arising from this that you're unable to resolve. And it might be worth establishing either a smaller, further, further small workshop or further full workshop to, this, to specifically address those issues. Adequate information may be needed for there might not be adequate information for one workshop and this can also lead to further. And sometimes the complexities of issues at hand require particular periods for contemplation. Delphi technique is a very specific uh, approach for workshops. Uh, and it's, it's really about trying to find the truth or some shared account between two or more groups of informants and um, or finding a common strategy. And really sessions begin with diverging groups both separately, the conflicting ideas are confronted and shared positions found. But what you'll do is you a facilitate will move between the two groups and look at what their core position is and where there is space for variation, where there is space for negotiation. Then that person will combine the inputs, pull together some level of look where the divergence of their disagreement, and then go back to the groups and see if they can't find now, okay, are there new spaces for negotiation? What do you think of these advice positions? And you continue until an agreement or clarity is obtained. Then there's work to, workshops of social action models. And this is really when you're looking at a workshops, and this is core to CBPR, when you're working not just to address specific issues, but to really address social change. And a lot of the process, if you go back to the stuff that I, in the first lecture from Paula Freire, and, uh, and the action research approach, this is really where the workshop feed into that. Where well, you might initially go into a community and there's quite limited sense of empowerment, quite limited sense of awareness of skill and knowledge. And so you'll work with the community to identify the issues and you might in that not attempt too much. You might say, okay, let's address one specific problem and try and find solutions around it. The community will work on that and they'll come back in six months' time and say, OK, we've addressed that, but we've become aware of more problems that exist in our community. So they come back with greater awareness, they come back with greater skills, and they come back with greater empowerment. And gradually, over this process, you develop a sense of power in this community, in this grouping. So they are more able to both take over and deal with issues themselves, but also act with power against whoever is restricting them and put pressure on state or um, owners, company owners, whoever is the controlling power to make changes. And, the work, and, and this year will, will be facilitated both in the successes between workshops, but also in the capacity to assert and talk and to be recognized within the workshop. And it often is the process of empowerment of building people within these situations. And, and it will also be a case of gradually incorporating more and more people. Initially it might be the male elders and gradually you'll start bringing youth and women into the group. The advantage of the workshop methodology is its flexibility and its capacity for sharing. And it's a sense in which the community provides their own agenda and process. 